Good afternoon, orchestra. Happy Monday. Uh, more importantly, happy Star Wars Day. It is May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Um, and in honor of Star Wars Day and of uh, just kind of starting of a new week, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that I have always been really interested in. Um, and it kind of piggybacks on what our musician friend Trevor Adams talked about last week in our Meet the Musician series. Every year, my wife and I uh, will do a movie marathon, and we always do two of them every year consistently. We do all the Harry Potter movies, and we do all the Lord of the Ring movies, including the Hobbit ones. Um, what we love so much about those movies, especially Lord of the Rings, is that uh, the score and the music in the movie really kind of helps weave a really cool story of its own throughout the characters and the environments that they go through. And so I thought I would give you guys a little kind of presentation um, for your guys' theory assignment, theory assignment uh, this week about music and storytelling. So let's check that out. All right, so here's our presentation on music and storytelling based on characters, places, and moods. We're going to go back in time and kind of start at the origins of using music in storytelling. And we're going to work our way all the way up to the present day and what that looks like now. So music and storytelling can tell us many things. Primarily, it tells us what characters are on screen or on stage or what characters are being spoken about, whether they're in front of you or off stage or off camera. Music can depict the tone or mood of the scene. And music can tell you where the story takes place. Music, just like the characters in our stories, can develop over the course of a production. So in a lot of these scenarios and instances that we're going to listen to, the music will carry the same general thematic ideas, meaning the notes will be the same, the rhythms will be pretty much the same, but over the course of time throughout a movie or uh, a play or an opera, the music will change a little bit depending on what's happening. So we have to understand three different words and three different ideas before we get into um, dissecting music and storytelling. We're going to look at three main words, a theme, a motif, and a light motif. So a theme is the most basic one. A theme is the main melody of a piece. It doesn't have to represent something, but it can. So a good way to think about this is generally just theme music. Um, the Star Wars opening theme, when the credits are rolling and the story is telling you, uh, or the dialogue is telling you what's going on, that's a theme song for that. Uh, all TV shows have some form of a theme song. It just kind of brings about, hey, this is the show, this is the movie, this is the whatever, and we're going to get started. Um, doesn't really represent anything. doesn't have to, I should say. Uh, a motif is a small portion of music that you can build a theme around. So it can be a hook. It can be a small little idea that without that, you would not get the whole theme. So it's something, mostly it's the thing that gets stuck in your head when you think of a certain melody. So that's the motif. Then you have a light motif. And a light motif is the most specific one. It's similar to a motif where it has to be a small portion of music, but it must represent something concrete in the narrative, meaning that it has to represent either a person, a place, an event, uh, an emotion. That's what its purpose is, is to represent a certain concrete idea. So some example of theme would be uh, Super Mario Brothers music. So as soon as the, the game starts, you get ba da ba ba da ba ba and then you're off to the races with a theme. Uh, Beethoven Symphony Number no. 5, that everyone knows, um, is constructed on a motif, but that small little idea is kind of woven through a very big concept. Um, and then, of course, uh, most recently, the Avengers theme. So we know that when all these heroes are on stage or on camera together, that uh, their primary music shows up to show kind of heroic triumph and bravery. So we have a motif. So we talked about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It all bases around these four notes, and they're down here in the bottom right of the screen where it says Allegro con Brio. Um, my webcam is cutting off part of it, but 
there's the fourth note in there, which just represents bum, 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 bum. And those four notes, Beethoven in his mind said that represented fate knocking at the door, telling him that um, everyone is mortal and that no one lives forever. So, you know, YOLO. So he takes those four notes and then he constructs an entire piece out of them. And that's what we know as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Uh, over here in this picture, you see there's a little excerpt from an old N64 game, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. You push these buttons in a certain order. You make a very small melody. This melody is the basis of a certain theme that is played. And that theme represents a character, um, a certain part of the day, um, a certain mood. But those six little symbols across the staff from the N64 controller would shape the melody. So if you can punch in that little hook, then you can play the rest of the melody. So we have a light motif. Now these are things that where the sound is representative of a certain other concrete idea. So if we're going back to the Super Mario's thing, uh, the coin sound, every time Mario hits his head against a block and a coin pops out or you pick up a coin, it makes an iconic sound. That sound is representative of the coin. So you can't really have one without the other. Um, there's a special chord we're going to look at here, and there's it's linked into the description as well, the Tristan chord. This chord is from an opera written by Wagner called Tristan und Isolde, meaning Tristan and Isolde. Um, and this sound is supposed to represent this tension that's between these two characters, kind of a Romeo and Juliet sort of uh, scenario. So these two lovers are beside each other, and this chord happens where it's like, Oh, there's tension. Like you know, you know, our families don't like each other. There's issues with our own lives. There's drama, um, and so this special chord represents that feeling. And then one here, uh, the Shire theme from the Lord of the Rings, which we'll talk about near the end of the presentation. So we can mostly attribute all of our ideas of light motifs and music and storytelling on a full blown scale to this guy, uh, Richard Wagner who was a brilliant jerk. Uh, Richard Wagner composed tons of huge operas. I mean, there were people writing operas before Wagner, but when he came on the scene, he wrote these elaborate, monstrous productions that, you know, they would be the versions of Hollywood blockbusters where tons of money was poured into set designs, uh, character costumes, the music itself, and the uh, musicians that were hired for it. Uh, his most famous one is uh, in English translation, The Ring Cycle, which is made out of four separate operas that you play basically in order, you know, not unlike a, a franchise, uh, like a cinematic franchise. When you do put them all together, it takes f about 15 hours to perform. Um, they have entire Wagner Ring Cycle festivals where people will come from all across the world. They lounge out on this big giant lawn, kind of like a big music festival, and they will perform the ring cycle over a series of days. So in components, so they can spend the night there, you get up, you have more food, and you just keep watching this giant production going on. Uh, Wagner coined the term Gesamtkunstwerk. He was German, hence where this word comes from. Gesamtkunstwerk means total artwork, meaning that uh, the music is interwoven with what's happening on the on the stage. The set design ties very much into this. It's just a whole grand thing. You can't have one piece missing in this whole production. Everything is needed to work together. Unfortunately, Wagner is also known or infamously known in history as uh, uh, a Nazi. He <laughs> um, had a lot of anti-Semitic opinions. There's uh, There are documents, though, that say that he was Jewish by heritage, but he kind of rejected these ideas. Um, he had Jewish associates, but uh, through a lot of uh, documents and a lot of uh, kind of uh, like journal entries from Wagner himself, just kind of stating that, eh, you know, I, he, was, he was a bit of a racist and a bit of an anti-Semitic, which is um, unfortunate to say the least. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a big fan of Wagner's work uh, when he rose to power because he felt that you know, someone of this high esteem making this great music was very much representative of the German culture. So he became kind of the poster boy um, in the 30s and 40s for Nazism and when it comes to music. So we tried to remember him and pick apart the pieces of 
uh, through through his works of like, okay, we'll we'll retain some of the things he left behind musically that were good, and acknowledge that yes, he was a uh, terrible person. So here's some of uh, some examples of Wagner's light motifs. The Tristan chord is represented here. So small melody that comes around, kind of meanders, and then boom, this chord highlighted in red is the Tristan chord. Very strange sounding chord. Um, it can be interpreted different ways when you analyze the chord, but it's supposed to represent this tension between two characters. Also part of the ring cycle, uh, right of the Valkyries. My eighth graders, you know this as um, the cello melody that shows up at the beginning of Cello Squadron. So that's where uh, we draw that inspiration from. There is a YouTube channel here that will send you to um, a playlist of just dozens of Wagner's light motifs. And Wagner didn't just write motifs for um, particular characters or like a setting, but he wrote mo light motifs based on emotions. So you don't have to watch them all or listen to them all, but just scroll through and look at the titles of some of these, of what they're supposed to depict. You know, he wrote a, a light motif for one of his operas just to describe thinking or uh, guilt, um, you know, sadness, uh, unrequited love, just different ideas that so whatever the character is feeling at the time, there was a sound for that. And if that ever happened again later on in, in the production or the opera, boom, that that sound came right back. So he had a very long, extensive catalog of different sounds for different uh, situations. So what does all this look like now in modern times? Well, in the 70s, Star Wars came out and... John Williams, who wrote the score for that, who also wrote Indiana Jones and Jaws and E.T., uh, came up with these really, really iconic themes. So you have the Star Wars main title theme. You kind of see from the banner above when the movie starts, you hear this theme. Uh, the Imperial March, which a lot of people you know, consider the Darth Vader march, uh, is another theme. But remember, a theme is just an entire melody that doesn't have to represent something. So if we dissect a little further and find the small little details, there's light, light motifs for love, for the Force, uh, for Darth Vader himself, uh, Princess Leia, who's a very prominent character in the movie. Um, and all these light motifs get woven through other parts of the movie that aren't just their standard iconic form. They show up every now and then, and you go, you can hear it in the background and go, oh, okay, so they're hinting at somebody or they're hinting at something. This YouTube link will show you a list of some of these themes and leitmotifs, and it will play you through over the course of about 10 minutes um, different spots in the movies where these certain instances show up. So you don't have to watch the movies yourself and kind of pick your way through it. Although, you know, since we're all quarantined, it might not be a bad idea to sit down and have a movie marathon. Okay, so now we get to the one I was talking about, Lord of the Rings trilogy. The Lord of the Rings trilogy was composed by Howard Shore, and it consists almost entirely of light motifs. Light motifs with a T that's missing in my slide. Um, there's not really a point in the movies where the music is just playing just to be there, just to be static. There's a reason behind every piece of music that's happening while the movie's going on. So they have references to a longing of going to go home, going back to something that's familiar. Um, different settings and different places around this fantastic world that the uh, books and movies take place in. They have different scores for that and different instrumentation as well. Uh, they have a theme for the ring, which is this you know, small little object that brings so much despair and darkness into the world. So it has its own theme uh, played on a solo violin. Um, and then themes for different characters as well. So when they mention a character or a group of characters together, a certain um, leitmotif performs. So there's a wonderful uh, video posted below uh, describing some of the leitmotifs and how even like the first five minutes of the movie start with just one different idea after the next representing a place, a time, characters, um, symbolism, it's really, really intense, but it's really, really cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Um, use this slideshow and video as a reference to answer some of the questions for the assignment that will be coming tomorrow. And we'll see you guys later.